thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so it's been a uh, pretty heady days for the West Australian grain industry. So for all those that haven't been involved in broadacre in Western Australia, you had a run of good years and um, farmers have been quite excited up until probably about a month ago for those in the north. Um, so there is a little bit of money floating around and it's going to be interesting to see how different businesses uh, reinvest that money. I put the uh, the always stop sign there simply because it was a photo I took from my uh, from my travels, and I just found it the most intriguing intersection that they have in America where everyone has to stop. Um, but I suppose it applies to reinvesting a surplus and, and maybe just doing a bit of an, an always stop and uh, and reassessing. So in terms of uh, my presentation, what I'll look at today is um, first of all how that surplus was created in Western Australia, and this will be through the lens, lens of the uh, Plant Farm Benchmarks. So for those unfamiliar to Plant Farm Benchmarks, uh, it's been going for about 40 or 50 years on broadacre farms, so it's probably one of the longest, uh, most established benchmarks in, in Australia. So we'll look at that. Um, just a word of, word of warning with benchmarking, um, the analogy I use, it's like painting fine art with a broad brush using a attached to a broomstick. So you do have to be a little bit careful with how you interpret data and um, you can sometimes interpret it the way you want to see it. But we'll look at that. It does, it does tell a story at the end of the day. Um, and then we'll look at investing that money. So looking inwards, uh, a lot of talk about reinvesting in, in land to make it more productive and that's probably been driven because of the price of land going up and farmers are now looking inwards for that reinvestment. But there also has been a lot of uh, expansion over the last few years and continues to be expansion at what West Australians would consider very expensive numbers, but our East Coast friends keep reminding us how cheap we are. Um, I think they're talking about our land, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, finally, we'll just touch on my, on my topic, which is looking at um, valuing industry advocacy. So what I've called their um, off-farm investing. So yeah, just and just a word of warning again with the benchmarks, it doesn't look at soil types and, and some of the soil constrictions, so some of these soil constraints, so some of these sorts of things. So just a very quick recap of what we saw last year and um, as Simon touched on, phenomenal year for West Australian grain growers. Uh, you can see through those blue areas, we had above average rainfall for the growing season. Combined with that, we had a really good break of the season, which means extra acres went in had more rain and uh, phenomenally we had even better water, had the best water to water use efficiency that we've ever seen because we didn't have any major frost events and we also didn't have any major heat events, um, something that we're experiencing again this year. But what that meant is we got a triple whammy of bigger hectares plus more rain plus better efficiency and um, probably hardly surprising that it led to better yields. So. The graph we're looking at here is uh, the, the yields in blue from last year for each crop, each of our major crops, and the yields in green for the 10-year average. And what you can see there is pretty consistently across all crops, we average 20 to 30% better uh, than, than long-term averages, which is, which is phenomenal across, like I said, bigger acres as well. So um, <clears throat> led to a, a 26 million tonne crop about 23 of it went into CBH. Last year we grew, uh, two years ago, we grew about 23 million tonne and said, we'll never do that again. And you know, that's once in a generation. And then lo and behold, the following year, we beat it by more than 10%. So, you know, you got you to tip your hat to the weather gods and to uh, also farmers, their innovation. And it's, it's a long time coming, a lot of those results. It's years and years of soil amelioration, technology, plant breeding, uh, these sorts of results don't happen overnight. Um, there's, you know, some saying about really great results don't happen overnight. They're sort of a, a, a 10, 15 year journey. So um, I think that's what we saw a culmination there. And then on top of that, we had phenomenal pricing, uh, albeit at the expense of our, our Ukrainian farming cousins, I suppose you could say. So, um, you know, a bit bittersweet, but did end up in a, in a phenomenal result. And how did that translate into revenues? So what we've got here is, and this is where our benchmarking really starts to kick in um, for Plan Farm, and I've stolen this off our consulting group. Uh, I hope they don't mind. They only released it a week ago. Um, I do the grain marketing side of things, so I've pinched these off the consulting group. 
So what we're looking at here is we break it into top 25% performers according to their productivity per millimetre of rainfall and then the average and then the bottom 25%. And uh, we're looking at farm income in the green. So for the top 25% phenomenal, $1,400 a hectare uh, operating revenue or farm income. And then uh, if you look at operating costs in blue, so, and then you have your operating profit in, uh, in grey. The, the thing that I really want people to focus on in this is what we're trying to see is how do the top 25% perform relative to the rest? And, and just be aware, this is about 450 farmers across the state and predominantly planned farm clients. So I'd like to think they're, you know, they're better than the average client. Um, so if you're in the bottom 25, don't feel like you're actually a bottom performer. It's just, it's, if you look at that distribution um, bell curve, a large majority of these farmers would be in the top end of that distribution. So the interesting thing though, is you look at the uh, operating cost in blue between the top 25 and the bottom 25, there's only a couple of hundred bucks in it. And then if you look at the revenue that they manage to generate, they increase it by, what's that, over $600. So your top 25% farmers are very good at knowing when to apply those extra inputs and chase that extra production. And as we'll see a bit later on, they're also pretty quick to pull back and close that checkbook in a bad year as well. So that's a phenomenal result for an extra couple of hundred bucks. They generated an extra $600 worth of revenue. Um, so if you want to know how to do that, probably speak to a lot of the farmers in this room because they're the ones that, that, that managed to achieve that. So that's a, a phenomenal result. Now, in terms of what that looks like for um, return on capital, 2018, we got over 10% return on capital and we said, we'll never see that again. And then it happened like three years later. Um, and then we've seen it in 2021 where we got up to 15% return on capital and we said, oh, we're due for one now. And then in 2022, we had another phenomenal year. So in the last five years, we've had three of our best grain growers, and, and this is mixed farming included, have had uh, their best return on capital uh, ever in the last uh, in the last five years, and, and by some margin, some of those as well. So pretty incredible. Like I said, a um, fair bit of money floating around. Where do you reinvest your money? Well, agriculture has probably been a pretty good reinvestment if you look at those numbers. Um, very good return on capital. Mind you, property prices have gone up a lot now. So generating those sorts of return on capitals, if property values have doubled in the last five or six years, which in many places they have and more, then um, in effect, and your production stays the same, then in effect, you'll, you'll halve your return on capital. Uh, a couple of busy little graphs here, but I'll, I'll sort of help you through them. What's been what's been driving this in, incredible um, gain in production and and really water use efficiency is the big one that we look at. And I know for people along the south coast, they've probably got excess water, so it probably doesn't apply to them as much. Um, the graph on the left, we've got our uh, water use efficiency for again the top twenty five, the average and the bottom twenty five, and. That's the, uh, well, it isn't it if you look at the trend line or the uh, the squiggly line. The main thing is, is you'll see that the bottom 25 have really fallen away over the last 10 years. And the middle and top 25 have continued to incre increase their water use efficiency more and more each year. And the bottom 25 have, to a degree, um, stayed pretty flat, plateaued. And that I think that shows you that a lot of farmers are reinvesting inwards into their farming systems. And you're also seeing, so not just soil amelioration is a huge one, and that is, looks different for everyone around the state, but you've also got improved technology, uh, Im improved plant varieties, better chemistry. Um, you've got improved farming systems, particularly for the likes of conserving moisture and, and going early, early planting. So there's a, and there's a there's hundred other things that you could throw on that list. Uh, but what, it, what you can see quite clearly there is the top really 75% have continued to pull away and that bottom 25% and maybe that it's going to take them a while if they want to catch up to reinvest or potentially they end up selling up and um, that top 75% come and buy it and rip, flip, um, spread, whatever you, whatever they do and uh, and try and bring it back up to a top performer. And uh, the other thing is, as you look at, go across to return on capital, you see how much water use efficiency and return on capital um, marry each other, uh, mirror each other. 
The thing that I find really interesting about this one is, is that surge effect where your top 25 in a good year surge ahead. Um, they don't just make small inroads, they make massive inroads. So they really make hay while the sun shines. Uh, and then in the bad years, they all get whacked with a bad year, but they don't go backwards any further than your bottom 25 or your average. So again, uh, you, you got to tip your hat to what farmers have been able to achieve over the last few years and how quickly they can make these phenomenal, powerful decisions. Uh, so last of the benchmarking slides, so reinvesting a surplus, uh, like I said, land values have increased significantly for our benchmarking clients. We're now seeing on average, an average client with $16 million, done, $16 million worth of land assets, uh, which is yeah, almost double, trip, getting towards triple where it was just 10 years ago. So that's both increasing their land size, but also increasing value. But it, then it does, and, and on top of that, the equity has gone up to almost uh, on average, uh, what is that, just over 90, between 90 and 95%. So not only are they growing, but are they reinvested back in their land, they've also increased their equity. Um, and I think, uh, so 91% of businesses have an equity percentage of above 80%. And you can see where we were back in uh, the end of those 2000s, where we had a run of dry years, tough years, equity got down towards 75 expanded, invested, reinvested, and equity still up towards 95%. So quite incredible set of, um, set of circumstances. So that's the benchmarking side of things done. I'll, um, I'll look at some of the reinvesting. So the way I've looked at reinvesting is there's on-farm investing, uh, which a lot of farmers are already doing. I dare say all farmers are doing in some, some level. So soil amelioration, advances in technology, uh, doing a lot of on-farm trials. And a lot of that is very expensive work, but they know they'll get a good return, of, return from investment from it. There's also what I call off-farm investing in the grain industry. A lot of these are three levies. So you've got um, the GRDC levy, which is bringing in around about $175 million per year, which is getting reinvested in research. Uh, you've got plant breeding royalties, which give or take might be $150 million a year. You've got grower groups, and these are back of the envelope numbers, but call it 25 million. So across those three areas, and this, this is me just sort of brainstorming uh, yesterday, actually. Um, what does that come to? $350 million in off-farm grain industry research and development. And then my topic, which I'll come to next, was looking at advocacy and the importance of social license and the, the role that voters and, and society will play in the future of farming. How much do we invest in that area? And I, I called it $15 million for the grains side of the industry, uh, nationally, $15 million. So it's about 1 20th of what goes into off-farm investment into R&D, and it's about 1 1 thousandth or of actual revenue from uh, that's generated. So 0.1%, whatever that comes out of, yeah, one one thousandth is being reinvested via grain industry advocacy. In my opinion, I haven't done those numbers, but if you want something again, uh, be around that. So what, is in, what, is, what does it look like? Value, um, how do you value advocacy? What does advocacy look like? So here's a few things, again, just brainstorming, more than happy for you to add, add things to the list, but I've put there um, getting access to chemistry and genetics, new chemicals, uh, GM, CRISPR, all these technological advancements that will help us get the next 20, 30%. Uh, will we have access to those going forward or will government regulation prevent us from accessing those? Social license, it's probably bandied around a fair bit, so I won't spend too much time on that. Public acceptance to farming, uh, I won't spend too much time on that. I can see Matt Hill's already got steam coming out his ears. I've <laughs> spent a few years on the WA Farmers Grains Council with Matt. I know it's one of his passions. Um, market access and market support. I think we actually do that stuff quite well. Uh, key government infrastructure. Uh, Simon can probably speak to that better than I can, but ports, roads and rail, are we getting government investing in, in agriculture like we need or are they just chasing votes in the city? Um, and then government regulations, both state and federal. And if you just look at in the news recently, uh, currently there's a um, roundup class action before the courts in Australia. 
uh, the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Act, which was a big deal in WA, but I believe the news made its way over, over east very quickly. And, and, and fortunately, the grower organisations did pull together on that one, and um, that has subsequently been repealed. Uh, China lifted its ban on Australian barley, but it's, it still mains, it maintains a uh, ban on canola. ICC has, um, I won't introduce ICC, but for those that know about it, it's sort of European um, farming principles and they've put increased some requirements or brought forward some requirements such as aerial application of certain chemicals, um, drought tolerant GM wheat to be commercially grown in Argentina. So are we all of a sudden at a um, disparity to what's happening around the world? And then net zero by insert date here, 2030, 2040, um, define net zero. I think a lot of people have committed to net zero. They don't actually know what net zero is. They don't know if they're talking scope one, two or three. They don't know about the quality of their credits, uh, their accus. There's a lot of junk credits out there and um, there's a lot of head scratching going on. <laughs> so bearing in mind, there was about $15 million, I called it, per year going into all those things. I can assure you my time spent with WA farmers, there's a lot of people doing a lot of volunteer work trying to, to really fight some of these beasts. And uh, in my opinion, it's, it's just we're not going to be able to um, stay in front of it. So lastly, a quick plug for my, my research. Uh, I was a 2017 fellowship uh, thanks to GTA and my, my topic was industry good functions necessary for an efficient, competitive Australian grain industry. My wife asked me what I studied last night and she yawned before I got to the end of it. So that wasn't a very good sign. <laughs> she said, you really need to work on that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so preparing for the industry for the challenges ahead. So that was five years ago. Now, I know a lot of you will run off and look this up and study it, but for those that don't, I've actually just put the conclusions right here in a handy slide. So I'll finish on this slide and apologies for, um, I'm breaking all the rules on, on doing presentations with that many words on the screen, but it's got the word investment in there a lot. So I thought that was pretty good. Um, the research good in, the research, uh, the industry good functions that need the greatest investment, especially by growers and grower organisations, are uh, researching and recommending improvements to the industry and politically representing and advocating on behalf of the industry. The biggest challenges the grain industry will face will come from within Australia by unaware voters and consumers, which will impact grower social licence to grow grain efficiently. This includes preventing the use of advanced plant breeding techniques, important chemistry, blocking government investment into essential infrastructure and enforcing environmental regulations. These limitations have the potential to significantly reduce, uh, I think it's supposed to be profitability for grain businesses, especially if international competitors are not burdened with the same impediments. The industry needs to have the research and social reach to ensure Australian voters and consumers support Australian grain growing businesses. Alongside prioritising the functions that will generate the greatest return on investment, the industry also needs to determine which organisations will focus on which functions. Currently, there is an overlap by many organisations for the provision of the same functions. This is creating duplication and gaps and creating complications when delivering key messages to consumers, voters and industry participants. Um, and I think most of that still stands today, mind you. We do have Grain Australia now, which is starting to remove some of those duplications, but I think there's still room to, um, to improve it. And I th I, it's inevitable we need to look at beefing up uh, grow advocacy. And uh, yeah, that's a topic for another day. So uh, thank you.